the conditioned soul in material consciousness is not seeing itself as the soul it is identifying itself with the body then the bodily identifications i am gujarati i am marwadi i am sindhi i am bengali i am indian i am american i am chinese i am mexican i am a human being and even worse i am the mind we don't even realize that the mind is different and i am different the mind creates thoughts think this think this think this and we keep identifying with the thoughts the scriptures in this in you are not thinking your mind is thinking why don't you distance yourself from the mind the end of all problems so that happens with practice of self knowledge slowly we learn to see ourselves as the soul distinct from the body distinct from the mind and finally even distinct from the intellect shri krishna says such a soul situated in karma yog resides in the city of nine gates in detachment neither thinking of himself to be the doer nor thinking of himself to be the enjoyer what is the city of nine gates bhagavad gita chapter 5 verse chanting is followed by translation and commentary by swami mukundananda सर्वकर्माणि मनसा सन्यस्यास्ते सुखं वशी नवद्वारे पुरे देहि नैव कुर्वन्न कारयन् The embodied beings who are self-controlled and detached reside happily in the city of nine gates free from thoughts that they are the doers or the cause of anything now those purified souls shri krishna relates what is their state so he is talking about the city of nine gates in the vedas he has talked about dahar vidya daharam pundarikam veshva dharosmin nantarakashas tasmin yadantas tadan veshtavyam he says that there is a city in the city is a house in the house there is a courtyard within the courtyard is a secret one who knows that secret knows everything that is to be known the city he talks about is the body <clears throat> the house in the body is the heart and the courtyard is the space of the heart and in that resides bhagavan so one who knows that brahma he knows everything that is to be known now here he is giving a similar analogy <coughs> he is saying that there is a city with nine gates and this is our body it has got the navadwar <coughs> two eyes two ears two nostrils mouth anus genitals nine gates to this body now the purified soul resides in the body like we all do but the difference is we are identified with the body that is not so serious even more serious is we are identified with the mind and we are identified with the intellect and we are identified with the ego and hence we are in this bound state now the mind is not us the mind is a mischievous monkey and this mischievous monkey called the mind is throwing up thoughts it has an algorithm of its own sometimes it says i am so happy i am so blessed 
to be in Swamiji's retreat. And then after a few moments it says, Oh, you know, but I could have, I had these other options. This was not the only thing I could have done. Maybe I made a wrong choice. So this is all being thrown up by the mind, not by the soul. The mischievous monkey called the mind is throwing up these thoughts. That is its job. And we, the souls, the mistake we are making is we are identifying with these thoughts. And that is why we are saying, now I am inspired, now I am not inspired, now again I am inspired, now again I am not inspired, based upon the state of the mind. But the realized souls, they create a distance between the mind and themselves. And seeing that mind as separate from them, they can understand, oh, at this moment the mind is trying to seduce me with a not so wholesome thought, with a non-beneficial detrimental thought. It is my choice whether I accept it or I don't. I choose not to. Now the moment you dissociate yourself from the thought, it loses its power. So the thoughts, they do come in all kinds. There is no limit to the kinds of negative thoughts. And then, if we see them as a part of us, they grip us. Like one lady, she came to me. She said, Swamiji, my brother died of cancer a few months ago. First she said, I'm in depression. I'm so sorry. So she said, my brother died of, of cancer five months ago. I said, really? So is that the reason for your depression? No, 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 no. That is all right. I have released that. <laughs> the problem is, I have started thinking that I will also get cancer. And then I heard in your mind management that if we think some thoughts again, we attract that those circumstances to our life. So here I am thinking I will get cancer, I will get cancer. And I am just thinking that will attract it to my life. So I am really and seriously worried. Now what is the mistake the lady is making? The mistake is, she is attributing those thoughts to herself. I am thinking like this, oh. Now the next moment I am thinking like, oh. That's not the way to do it. The moment you adopt the thought, moment you see yourself as the source of it, it becomes energized. And then it becomes stronger and comes to you again, and then it comes to you again, until it starts creating a new neural pathway. And you feel that you are in the grip of this negative chintan. Now, we realize that some of these thoughts, they don't align with our goals, or they may not even align with our values. They may be immoral. So when people have those thoughts, why am I thinking like this? And the moment they start doing that, they have energized the thought. That's exactly what the thought wanted. The power. And you have empowered it. Now instead, a more enlightened way is, oh, okay, a thought has come. I am not interested. Like the birds fly in the sky, they just fly away. One moment here, the second moment they are gone. It's not that you have to chase every bird that comes. It is the same with these thoughts. That freedom comes from self-knowledge when you deeply contemplate the fact that you are not your mind. You are the seer of the mind, the soul. That monkey mind can work to your benefit. It can work to your detriment. So it is for you to train it the way you want. Now supposing you are in the dark and a stranger accosts you all of a sudden. You see this big hulky guy. You have two options, either to run from there 
or to attempt to fight him because you know that he is going to mug. So you have to either fight this danger or run away from it. But supposing you are walking on the street and little children start heckling you. So is it advisable to fight them? No, because they will only be provoked. Is it advisable to run? No, because they will run after you. So in this case the advisable thing is to ignore them. They will say, you know, we teased him, maja nahi aya, let's tease the next guy. <laughs> Likewise, moment you accept the thought as your own, that thought gains an energy. And the moment you distance yourself from it, it loses its energy. That is the basis of the Sakshi Bhav. Sakshi Bhav is witness consciousness. So in Sakshi Bhav, the self-realized sages, they surf the emotions and sensations in the body. They can even surf the pains in the body. Surfing means they just surf it. That is why their ability to tolerate pains, because they see the pain is coming and they say, okay, it is coming, but I distance myself from it. That same Sakshi Bhav, has become popular in the Western world in a diluted form as mindfulness. So in mindfulness, this knowledge is not there in the mix that I am the soul. But the concept is given of watching your thoughts. So the intellectuals, the academicians, the scholars, they find this a very convenient philosophy. There is no need to believe in either the soul or in God, no need to have any kind of faith. And yet you have this powerful tool for mind management, mindfulness. But it's in original form in the Vedas, it is the witness consciousness. So Sri Krishna is saying the same here. He says, Arjun, this self-realized souls. They stay in this body and they remain in witness consciousness. So they are able to retain their elevated state of thoughts and consciousness.